somewhere else. Take your Bibles. Go with us to the 102nd Psalm, please. Psalm 102. Psalm 102, please. Glory to God. We shall see the King. We shall see the King. I just, I just was trying to think about that from my own perspective. Lord, help me to see you as King and know that you are my King and to rejoice in that. One verse of Scripture I wish to read this morning, a little, maybe a little bit of a, a different a message, but Psalm 102, please. There's a verse that I want to focus on in this psalm, and we're going to be dealing with various things from the psalm itself. But I want to read verse 14. That's the verse that I want to try to just drive home and to have you leave here today with something well, on your mind, at least from this message, still got this afternoon's sermon too, but I, I want you to, to have something resonating in you to think about so that we can grow. And this verse says, For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. Would you say amen to God's Word? Amen. You may be seated. I want to preach to you this morning on stones and dust. Stones and dust. I was reading, these psalm, reading through the Psalms, I don't know, this month here recently, and, and uh, just having read this psalm, it stuck out to me in a way that this verse just got a hold of me and I couldn't leave it and I've just been throwing it around in my mind for some time and uh, but I believe the Lord would have us to go there this morning and share some thoughts to you with you in reference to this verse of scripture for thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof first of all let me mention to you some things about the psalm itself and then I want to talk about the first of all the meaning of that verse I want to talk about the man that said it and, uh, and, the, and the writer of the, of the psalm and then the message that, that uh, comes out or, or that follows as a result of that effect what, or that, that verse and its effect and uh, what came as a result of that. First of all, if you'll note in your Bibles, more than likely there, there's a, a title of this psalm. It says, A Prayer of the Afflicted When He is Overwhelmed and Poureth Out His Complaint Before the Lord. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. That is the sense. This psalm is a prayer. But in the prayer he acknowledges various things. And so it's a prayer that uh, a man that is undergoing great stress and great affliction. Now that may not be where you are. But I think one of the things that I would say to you is that that is where it's coming to. And if we don't get afflicted, we're going to, I'm telling you right now, we're not going to see what we need to see. And in some ways, we may see the great persecution and yet come to this nation that would bring that affliction. But I will tell you, there is also where we ought to purposely afflict our own hearts as a result of certain things and the condition of certain things. And so there is an affliction that can come to you from outside circumstances that are, are simply upon you and overwhelming your heart. Such as it was no doubt with the psalmist but there is also a, a purposely uh, afflicting of your own self that you put yourself in uh, fastings and, and prayer that you give yourself to uh, uh, deny yourself certain things and, and seek after God because you see the condition that is around you and it would be more comfortable for you to do otherwise but you choose a path of affliction because you wish to humble and break yourself before God and, and ask God to come and do a work that needs to be done among us. And we may come to the place where the afflictions will come from without, but if not, let them come from within so that you and I may afflict our souls and call for a day of fasting and prayer for God to move among us in a way like we have never seen before. And that is the sense of this psalm. And he, he, he brings out various things and I'll, uh, I'll get to that moment momentarily, but I want to focus on this verse 
There are some major themes about God that come out of the psalm itself. But I want to focus here on this this verse 14 and, and then some things in the psalm that we can learn in light of that verse itself. So we got this, and he talks about, if I can read verse 13 with it, Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. He is in reference here to Mount Zion. Now Mount Zion in, in Scripture has often come to, to be uh, synonymous with that of uh, Jerusalem. But there were a couple of mountains. Jerusalem is, is kind of built and was surrounded by mountains the Bible talks about as the mountains are around about Jerusalem so the Lord is around about his people and so it's a city of mountains and built there on hills and there is Mount Moriah and Mount Zion there was a Mount Zion it's a particular mountain there but also Zion became more so to just be uh, synonymous with that term Jerusalem so that this is the place from which God rules in Psalm 2 he says I've set my king upon my holy hill of Zion and refers to the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ when he rules in that millennial kingdom and rules now presently. He's not going to rule. He, he is going to rule, but he rules now. He's already king. He's not. We're not waiting to crown him. He's already been crowned king and, and, and that simply come waiting for the day when he will publicly appear unto this world. We're waiting for that. But he's already king. He's already there and that's been established. So we have this Heal of Zion. And it appears from the from the passage that there has been some some uh, a disaster, and that basically that Zion is not re- re- receiving the attention that it ought to receive, and so that he says that now the time has come for her to be favored, and that God is going to rise up and have mercy upon her. It's as if she is under a judgment, and, and therefore, the, but God is getting ready to lift the judgment and show mercy and favor under her again for her set time in verse 13 is mentioned her set time is come and and he saw that that there is a time oh I'm glad that God is not a God of random activity I'm glad that God is not a God that is determining things uh, by the stars or the moons or or, or by some other system but God already knows it and has it down and there's a set time God's going to do something God's going to work he told him when you go into Babylon you got 70 years And when 70 years are over, he's going to bring them out. But it wasn't just automatic. 70 years are over and Daniel is down there praying for God to bring them out. God had a set time and he said, I'm going to send rain again on Israel. But just because he promises rain doesn't relieve us of the responsibility of praying for that rain. And just because God has promised a revival and a move of the Holy Ghost does not relieve us of the responsibility of praying praying for that revival to come and lay in hold of it. And his time has come and the psalmist recognizes and he says, your servants, I can see it coming on the horizon. I can see it, Lord. The time has come and you're getting ready to rebuild her. You're getting ready to do a mighty work among us. You're getting to rise up and to show her mercy and favor again. Because why? I see something happening. I see her servants. I see, Lord God, your servants that are are beginning to take pleasure in her stones. And I see some your servants that are beginning to favor her dust. The word dust is also translated rubbish over in Nehemiah. Maya. It talked about the rubbish and it was the idea of the stones of that formed the buildings and the wall of the city and then the rubbish. Whenever there was those stone stones were destroyed or toppled or, 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 or knocked down, then they, they formed a pile and that pile of stones mingled with the dirt and some of the stones are crushed and broken, formed a pile of dust or rubbish if you will. And that's the word that's here. It's the idea that there has been some kind of a judgment and so things are broken down they're not the way they used to be but now he said your servants rather than taking pleasure in the world rather than taking pleasure in some godless uh, earthly city like Babylon oh there's nothing there maybe in Zion it looks to the world like a pile of stones and a pile of rubbish but the people of God have come again to take pleasure in the 
stones of the city of God and in that pile of rubbish they're going to reach down and do something with it and they're becoming excited again about the very stones and building blocks of the city of Zion. Now let's take that for a moment and think about it. Just what do those stones mean? Those stones represent something. And I'm not making them symbolic. I'm I'm making them literal. I want to get the literal and draw a lesson from it. There were stones in Jerusalem. And there were stones in the city of Zion. And the stones, as I said, were there. They formed the walls. They formed the buildings. When they built the building or the temple that had been built, they formed stones in the quarry and they brought them from the quarry unto the unto the temple and built them and, and there's the cornerstone and then there's the stones uh, one stone laid upon another you remember the, the the judgment that would come later upon the temple in Jerusalem Herod's temple and Jesus said not one stone will be left upon another so they built the buildings out of stones laying one upon another and, and resting them there and then when they're together they formed a uh, whether it be the temple, whether it be the king's palace, whether it be somebody's house, whether it be somebody's store, whether it be a a shelter, an inn, a stable, whether it be a wall that is surrounded, defending the city, whether it be a tower that is erected for the watchman to see, it's all built out of stone. These are the basic building blocks of the city itself. And a couple of things that that indicates. Number one, those stones represent a history. They represent and tell a story. Have you ever walked into an old house sometime? It's maybe a hundred or, or more than a hundred years old. Several families have lived there. Children have been born in that house. There are things that have taken place. Maybe somebody has died. There's been evening after evening, conversation after conversation. And we say, if these walls could talk... There may be secrets there that will not be revealed until the day of judgment. But we say if these walls could talk, my, the stories that could be told just from this house. All the while the people were active around it. The walls were there and they were witness, if you will, to all of the events that took place in that place. And that house has got a history. Family that has lived there, born and died. Meal after meal, evening conversation after evening conversation when somebody's sick, when someone was well, Christmas time, holiday times came, birthdays were celebrated. It may have been poor, it may have been rich, but there's a story that is there. As a, and I'm telling you, every stone in Jerusalem had a story to tell. It told a story of a history of a nation that had been birthed out of the slavery of Egypt and had come out of the place, out of the place of bondage and had been restored and built as a nation. And David went in and took it from the Jebusites uh, and build up the city of David and establish it as a place uh, where God's name could be known in all of the earth. He brought, I was mentioned this morning, the ark would be brought to Jerusalem. Later on, Solomon would build the temple there and Jerusalem would become the center. They would tell you in some sense uh, that the center of the world, if you will, is Israel. And the center of Israel is Jerusalem. And the center of Jerusalem is her temple. And there it is for them. Uh, That temple is the very focal point of the entire world's activity and economy because there's where God would manifest his presence and God said I chose to put my name there all the time he manifested his presence in the wilderness they were wandering there was the pillar of fire by day and the cloud or by night and the cloud by day and they were wandering and the ark would rest for a while and it would sit here in this place and then they would move up and move to another place it came into Canaan land and it would go for a while at Shiloh it would be at other places and rest there but none of the those places became permanent until a man named David came along and said, I'm going to build. I'm going to make a place. God has established my kingdom. I want God to have a permanent dwelling place. And his name was settled at Jerusalem and Mount Zion. And there the name of the Lord will be forever. The very celestial city that you and I are going to dwell in forever is known as Jerusalem. 
In the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that you and I have come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. And the, the sense that that's where we dwell. We are not no longer a people of Mount Sinai in that regard. That's the wilderness experience. But we've come into the land of victory, unto Mount Zion, where God has given us victory over our enemies. And God has liberated us from death and enslavement. He has liberated us from sin. And we are dwelling in the capital city of God. This is the capital city of God. I just want you to understand today, I would that we could again take pleasure in some history. Sometimes we forget the lessons of the past. We forget who we are and where we came from. When Israel forgot where God brought her from, then she went astray. When Israel forgot about Egypt and the wilderness, when she forgot who gave her that city of Jerusalem, when she forgot David her king and the glorious events that God had brought and the victories under the nation. She turned aside and whenever a nation forgets her history, she will turn aside. America has forgotten where she came from. America has forgotten the building blocks and the foundation stones of her nation. And I would that we had a people that would rise up again and take pleasure in the stones that built the nation. A history. How about it, church? Let's take it in Christendom. If we just take the history of Christianity, if we just go back and start in the Gospels, if we even for a moment turn away or not turn away, but just not even focus on all of the Old Testament that brought us up to the New Testament. But what a history you and I have. I'm here to tell you, I'm not divorced from that Bible. I am not separated from that Bible. I'm a part of the story. Oh, glory. This church this morning is connected to Acts chapter 2. We are connected to Matthew chapter 1. We are connected to Luke chapter 24. We are connected to John's gospel. Because the gospel we preach uh, is the very gospel of this book. The Holy Ghost that fills us uh, is the very same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the very God we worship uh, and the way we worship Him in spirit and in truth is the same as it was uh, in the book of Acts. And I'm here to tell you, we're still part of the story. The book is still being written and the Holy Ghost is still working. And we've got a story to tell. And I wish that we could bring it back uh, and look at the stones again and say where have we come from and what kind of people are we today I like I like new things I like sometimes to see improvements that can make something operate better but I am weary of our culture today that thinks nothing old in a very real sense is worth preserving. Yeah. And that we're always looking for something new and exciting. Right. Something that works faster. Something that goes farther. Something that jumps higher. Something that, that does it more and, and gives you more, more, more. It seems like for me that every time I find a product that works for me, I love it, it works, I'm happy. They quit selling it because of some new improved that comes out. And for me, the new improved never seems to be as good as the old and tried. And that's the way sometimes it's become with religion and with Christianity. We're looking for a new improved Christianity. We don't need a new and an improved Christianity. We need the Christianity that's been there. I will tell you the Christianity of the Apostle Paul is the same Christianity we need today. I will tell you the Holy Ghost anointing of Peter is the same Holy Ghost anointing we need today. What my father and grandfathers and great grandfathers experienced and that same Holy Ghost movement that brought conviction upon people that brought them to their knees and repentance and weeping and crying that same old fashioned truth that would bring people out of their bondage and bring them down to a place of humility before God is the same Holy Ghost we need today we don't need it whitewashed we don't need it made different we need the same mountain and power that will work in a culture that is decadent such as ours we just sometimes I, I thank God for for Christmas, I thank God 
for sometimes things like that because <clears throat> we have formed traditions. And in our world today where everything is so fast and so crazy, just keeping up with it, if you're not careful, it'll make you lose and leave your traditions. It'll make you leave the, the history that you have that connects you, that reminds you of who you are and where you've come. I've read several stories about people that talk about those, those days gone by and the Christmas has passed. Everything is changing. Mom and dad dies. Grandma and grandpa dies. There was those, there was those Christmases you had together as a young child and you all gathered around uh, grandma and grandpa. But then the time comes that grandma and grandpa dies. The children get older and they all move away and they become disconnected and in their disconnection they lose it and they, they go different directions and that, that, that tradition that was a part of that family history is lost and thrown away. The old home place oftentimes becomes a place that is just lost to the rubbish and, and left in the pile but oh would that somebody would go back and say I'm going to revive a stone hallelujah. I see something in a stone back there and I find more pleasure in the stone that tell me from where I came that I do of a changing world that doesn't know where it's going. I want to know where I've came from and that I know where I'm going in a world that's aimless and is just greedy and looking for more. I need an anchor. I need a stone. I need a stone. Glory to God. I've got to get a hold of a stone somewhere that'll keep me connected to who I am and what I'm all about. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Don't let this world swallow you up. If you're true to what this church believes, if you're true to what this Bible says, and you believe and know why you're here this morning, you're an old-fashioned holiness, a Pentecostal believer, that's who we are. We are believers in Jesus Christ. Amen, Brother John. And what happened years ago, and the power that fell in Azusa Street, the power that fell at Pentecost, the power that fell in England, the power that fell in Africa, that's who we are. That's where we came from. Don't shut it out. We didn't come from this charismatic junk that has birthed in this world today. We didn't come out of that mess that's a peace in the world. Our history goes beyond that. We go back to men and women who built the stones. We go back to the place where they put down some building blocks and the Holy Ghost fell and a church was born in the power of God. The history of the Pentecostal movement doesn't come from this charismatic junk today. You've got to go back. You've got to go back. They've torn it down. They've destroyed what it was. Everything's become hype. Everything's become artificial. It's become a sham. There's nothing you can sink your teeth into. There's nothing that seems to be real. It's just a put on. It's entertainment. It's big business. But I'm telling you, I'm looking for some stones. Oh my, I'm looking for that which connects me to what I am. I'm telling you, let's bring it a little closer home. We can sit here and talk about the goodness of God, but I want you to tell you this church, this local church was birthed in a barn. This local church was birthed in a prayer meeting that was held for, for some years or for some time, and then we met in a barn. You better not scorn that history. You better not scorn where we came from because that's who we are. We, we, we fought so much of what we believe. We were willing to leave our comfortable churches. We were willing to leave the fellowship of people that we've been with for years so that we can get together with some folks who said, I found some stones. I found some stones. And I'm not letting go. Glory to the Lamb of God. And so we got a hold of it and we begin to worship in a barn because we wanted to build on a foundation that was unchanging that was never going to fade away and has been there from day one. Glory to the Lamb of God. God, hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Amen. And today, here we are. And we're facing challenges this morning. The culture is enveloping us. Our passions are dying. Our time is getting sucked into the vortex of today's activity. And you and I are struggling to keep pace. So much happening. 
that our time with Jesus gets less and less. Come on now. Our worship loses its edge. And if you can say what you want to, but there's some rubbish. There's some breaking down. The fire and the gleam in the eyes not as bright as it used to be. Come on now. The prayer isn't as rich as it used to be. The worship isn't as tight as it used to be. The life isn't as tight as it used to be. The fervency isn't what it used to be. But I would that somebody said, I'm going back in favor of the dust. I'm going back and reach into that rubbish pile. That's where I am. That's where I came from. And I'm going to build again. I'm going to start all over. Glory to the Lamb of God. Let God raise up and build up Zion when the people take pleasure in the stones and favor the dust thereof. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Glory. Four men, Brother Alb, Brother Doug, Brother CB, and myself, we met every Friday. We had prayer meeting after prayer meeting when this church was but a handful of people. We met every Friday and we prayed and we sought God. And God gave us a revival. And God has blessed us with buildings. But it's something that seems to be the history of revival. That once you you have revival, people start living right, they dig in. And the result of that is God blesses them. And when God blesses them, they get all the material goods. And they get the blessings. And they get lazy. And they get relaxed. And they forget more. They put more time with the blessing than they do with the blessing giver. I'm telling you somewhere. And what we find is after a while this stone begins to crumble and this stone begins to crumble and the very foundations upon which we are built are left unattended and if they're left unattended the doctrines will no longer be taught and the teaching will no longer be there. We'll no longer seek after the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We'll no longer cry out for the healing and the miracles because somebody has left off the stones. I'm telling you the church wasn't built on a worldly precipice. It wasn't built on worldly principles. It wasn't built on appeasing the world. It was built on people that went out and preached the truth in an idolatrous land. They preached Jesus and Jesus alone in a polytheistic world that was filled with idols. The church was not birthed by catering to the world. The church was not birthed by trying to find programs that can relate to people where they are. They didn't go out and try to find a way to relate to them in their pagan temples. And so that we can, hey, we've got to find something that interests them. We've got to get this group together. We've got to make it look like their paganism so that they will want to come over to us. They went out and condemned their temples and condemned their idols and preached that it's the way Jesus and he's the only way that men can be saved for there is no other name given among men whereby we might be saved but on of that name I'm telling you they went out into that world and when they said don't preach in the name of Jesus they said we but can speak only that which we have heard and that which we have seen they preached in any way they suffered they died for it but they built a church and that's our history and we're a part of that building today glory to God What is your history? There's some of you in here, you come from that church of God. I was third generation. You can remember those old meetings. Your history, this nation, some maybe Pentecostal holiness. Some of you, some other independent holiness church. But you were as common sinner as everybody else. You went down. It got a hold of you. You dressed like the world. You acted like the world. But when Jesus got a hold of you, he made you different. Glory to God. Woo, hallelujah. The worldliness was around years and decades ago. The major denominations in America, Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists, they've compromised decades ago. Look, where they're at today is simply from the result of the compromise years ago. Over a hundred years ago, we were in those churches and we were saying, I am tired of the deadness. I'm tired of the dryness. There's got to be more to it than this. And people begin to pray and the Holy Ghost begin to 
fall in the mountains of North Carolina, at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. I'm telling you across this nation, the Holy Ghost began to fall and people begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. That's who we are and where we came from. That is our history and it's written on the stones. It's written on the stones. And I would we go back and read it again? I would we go back and look at it again? Just where have we come from? That's where we've come from. Our destiny hasn't changed. Our goal hasn't changed. We're still a people of God called out of this world to live the way God wants us to live. Hang with me a minute this morning. I wish I could awaken you. I wish we could just somehow. Let me ask you, what do you take pleasure in today? Or has your life become such a whirlpool that you're just doing all you can do to keep your head above water? Life was not meant, I don't care how fast it is. It was not meant for us to live it in such a way that we are just constantly treading water and doing our very best just to survive. The devil wants to get you in a trap where all you can think about is what your problems that are enveloping you. You're absorbed in them when you come to church. You're absorbed in them when you leave church. When you get up in the morning, they attack you. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it. Your kids are lost. There's sickness. There's trouble. There's difficulty all around you. And your prayer life has went to a, down to a little bit of nothing. You're whispering to God during the day. But quite frankly, you're drying up like a leaf in fall. I'm telling you that it's like the water and the very life is getting sucked out of you. And you go to church and you want to get in but you don't feel like getting in preacher's preaching and he seems excited but it ain't doing nothing for you I'm telling you what problem is this there's a pile of stones and you need to go back and look at them again glory to God you need to shut down your life a little bit go find the morning get somewhere and get you five minutes and read the story of how you came to be read the story of your life look at some stones glory to the love of God look in the rubbish and find you a rock and get a hold of it. Glory to God. Woo! Yeah, hallelujah. Glory. I don't know how far I'm going to go with it this morning. Do you know how important history is? I, I preach a lot. I tell a lot of history in my preaching because history is critical. Our world's trying to our liberal, man, they're beyond liberal, per, right. simply perverted. Yeah. They're not liberal, they're, they're just downright perverted. Yeah. I told you the other day that our history book, D. James Kennedy was surveying, public high school history book, high school or middle school, I forget which, but Seven pages on Marilyn Monroe. Two paragraphs on George Washington. That's not history. That's an agenda. Right. You need to understand that. That's no longer about history. That's about an agenda. That's about taking people and turning their minds around. Come on, brainwashing them and putting into them so that they think that the great foundation and the great idea of America came out of Hollywood. Come on, so that Hollywood is where we're really birthed. Yeah. Just look at all the stars uh, and look at all that, that junk and, and the Marilyn Monroe's and, and the emphasis. Look at all the freedoms we get. Yeah, I'll tell you, look at those freedoms you got, but you're going to have to go back before Marilyn Monroe. You're going to have to go back before Hollywood came to ever be. You're going to have to go back before we ever had the Louisiana Purchase uh, and before we ever got California. You're going to have to go back uh, to some pilgrims uh, that came across the ocean and landed, oh, hallelujah, put in Massachusetts and begin to proclaim the word of the Lord. You have to go back further than that to England. You're going to have to go back to the word of God and a man, you're going to have to go back to Germany and a man named Martin Luther who said it's by the word of God and by faith I will live. You have to go back further than that and if you keep going, you're going to get back to a man named 
name Jesus. Yeah. Glory to the Lamb yeah. of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lord. And our emphasis in America is democracy, 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 freedom, freedom, yeah, freedom, yeah. freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom this, freedom that, freedom that. Yeah. We don't even know what freedom means. Right. And the interesting thing about it is, is that the more freedom we talk about, the less of it we've got. That's exactly right. true. And the only people that seem to be free to do what they want are the perverts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. And they can spill their filth out, filth out and they can oh. talk their junk. And they can promote their garbage. But if you've got any moral principle and if you've got any faith in Jesus right. Christ, you are on the outside. Right. That's not freedom. No sir. no, sir. That's the devil's agenda. Yeah. That's what that is. To try to separate us and divorce us from our history. Oh, yeah. oh glory to oh, God. Yeah. I'm here to remind this church this morning. You were born, even this local church again, 22 years ago in a barn. We shouted. Right. We praised God. Woo, glory. We had an old beat up piano that came out of a honky tonk somewhere, I think. I'm telling you, that thing didn't, hey, it couldn't, didn't hardly stay tuned. It wasn't very much. But that's what we were. And we were happy. Glory to the Lamb of God. You came to church and you shouted when the wind blew the carpet lifted up off the floor I could hear the chicken sometimes uh, as they roosted and as, or as they crowed the roosters rather crowing on a Sunday morning but oh my we were happy because we were filled with joy we were filled with hope uh, because we got a hold of some stones hallelujah we got a hold of some stones uh, and they were connecting us uh, to some old timers uh, that had come out long ago and we said we're pioneers uh, we're on a mission we're going to rebuild again on the old foundation we stand in the way and we're asking for the old paths give me that old time religion give me that old time religion hallelujah glory to the Lamb of God glory to the Lamb of God this modern society knows nothing about what has given them the blessings they have I could talk all morning about the history, but those stones don't just speak of history and tell a story. But those stones speak of labor. Stones don't automatically form a building. It takes sweat. It takes skill. It takes engineering. It takes planning. It takes resources. Somebody's got to go out to the mountain and cut the rock. Somebody's got to shape it at the quarry. Somebody's got to carry it into the place where the building is. Somebody's got to place it and line it up with the cornerstone. Oh, glory to God. And he lines it up and it's days of sweat and toil. It is work that oftentimes goes, it's thankless. It goes unrecognized. Oh my, but generations to come get to bask in the blessing of being in a secure house because somebody they work to build it. You are not here today on, on your own labors. I'm here there to you tell are. you, I cannot boast right. that I have brought about this Come movement. On. I can only tell you that somebody tread the path before right. me. Go into the Lamb of God. Oh. Somebody's sacrifice has made it possible that I can preach here to you today. Yes. A mom, a dad, a grandpa, a grandma, a great granddad, a great grandma. They have made it so that you and I can be what we are today. truth. Yes. I was reading about that century, the 15th century, I think, of time and into the 16 or 1500, 15th and 16th centuries. The birth of Martin Luther, the birth of Philip Melanchthon and other men, John Calvin and Wycliffe. You see, we, we revel in those men today. But in their day, it was nothing but rejection and sweat yeah. and tears and blood. Yes, yes. I 
can sit here and tell you. I can sit in the comfort of my office and read the writings of John Wesley and be stirred to no end and be thrilled and preach you a message by the help of the Holy Ghost that stirs us. But I'm here to tell you when he was doing it, it was mile to mile on a horseback. It was early four o'clock every day. It was blood and sweat and tears. We've become an unappreciative generation. We need to go back and look at some stones again. We've become a generation of things. We've got it all together. We've got a young generation that raised up and don't even have a clue where they come from or how they got it or why they're here. I'm telling you, you've got no reason to be proud and to boast this morning because somebody laid the work. Somebody did it before you ever came along. And I'm here to rejoice. And I'm here to joy in God because somebody labored to build those stones. They may even be fallen and it may be in a pile of rubbish but somebody put them there. I'm not in an empty field. I'm not aimless wandering around. I've at least got a pile of stones and I'm going to dig through the stones and take pleasure in the labors of those of ages past. You like this nice church today? You like this comfortable building. You ought to thank Brother Al. Who left the comforts of his church and sanctuary. And went to do something that people in the 20th century don't do. They don't worship in pack houses. That once you've had padded pews and carpet. You don't go to an old pack house. It's got cracks big enough to throw a cat out, and and you build steps up the side and make it workable, and invite people, and they come, but they're taken back that anybody would worship in a barn. On, That's right. silly. On, we used to do it in old storefronts. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter right, if it's the back side of a house. If it was an old shack on Railroad Street, it didn't matter. All that mattered was one thing. The presence of God almighty. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. But today, you've got a respectable building. Today, you sit on respectable pews. You shouldn't have to be ashamed, and yet we do it less than ever. I think we invited more people to the barn than you do to this nice place. You don't have to be ashamed to invite anybody to the facilities that we've got. Amen, church. I'm telling you, this house don't have the power of God. And if we don't have the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I wouldn't give you three cents for it. I'd rather be back in a barn. If that's what it's going to come to, I'm not interested in it whatsoever. But it's not in the pews or the carpet on the floor. It's in the glory of the presence. And there's some stones here this morning we can get a hold of. Glory to God. Because we labored to build it. And let's keep on building. You ought to thank this man who surrendered. Church of God credentials who was mocked and ridiculed. Young folks know nothing about it. You weren't even in the world. You weren't even here. But he said, I got a stone. Oh, Oh, hallelujah. The church of God had become a pile of rubbish. Yeah, yeah come on now, brother. And the liberal movement was sweeping the rubbish out the door. Yeah. And as they swept the rubbish, swept the rubbish out the door and began to build on a new foundation. Mm-hmm. They swept some good ministers out right. the door. Amen. And they said, I don't want a new foundation. Right. I'm going into that pile of rubbish. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm going to dig around in them stones. Go over to the Lamb of God. Oh, I found me a stone of holiness. I found me a stone of righteousness. I found me a stone of the joy of the Lord. I found me a stone of the Sermon on the Mount. I found me a stone of the law of God. And I'm going to build on it again. Go over to the Lamb of God. I'm going to take that stone and set it up. And there I will build. There I will build. Go over to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That stone says somebody has labored and worked to bring you where you are. Woo! Right, 
That stone says one other thing. That stone says order. What do I mean by that? Again, those stones have been cut a certain way. They were placed a certain way. They built that wall a certain height. They built particular buildings in a certain way. Ooh, hallelujah. And they didn't build buildings just to build buildings. They built that temple out of those stones, Brother John. And when they built that temple, there was a design in mind. Oh, hallelujah. God had given them a pattern on how you build that temple. And when they built that temple, they built it with an eye in mind. It's built on the mount. It was a focal point for the city because in that city there was an order of life. And in the life of that city, the God who is represented by the ark in that temple is the center of this city. This city here today is alive because of the God that is manifest in that temple. Oh, hallelujah. And the glory that came down when Solomon dedicated that temple and the priest couldn't even minister for the glory of God. That was the life of that city. There was a particular order. There was a king that sat on the throne and the king was there because God put him there. God said you could have a king but I'll pick him. God had anointed David king. God had anointed Saul. God had reached down in the sheepfold and he didn't get one of the older brothers, Eliab. He found a shepherd boy and said, that's the kind of king that I'm going to have over my people. The law was read and explained by the priest. That's the order of this city. Those stones are not random activity. They're the result of a people of purpose and a people of design and live a certain way and a certain lifestyle. Amen. 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 Yes. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Woo! You're not careful. You hear me? We went last night to eat at uh, China Bay Restaurant. Our new China restaurant in Chakawinity that's got ties into this church. And uh, saw Sister Shameen up there at that cashier and Sister Heather Silva. I'm telling you, they looked as out of place as a football on a baseball field. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> little Charmin running around like a little old spry Benny Rooster in here about this. But she's doing it and looks like a woman. Yeah. She's dressed like one. She stands out like one. Whether it's cold, but she's she looks very feminine. Her sister Heather in her skirt. Waitresses all had pants on. But here are two Christians shining out yeah. in the middle of that. Right, and they look strange. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I'm going to tell you why they look strange. Because they got some stones. Yeah. Oh, glory right. to God. Right. Hallelujah. Let me tell you right now, you have no right to build the church any way you want to build it. You have no right to determine how you should look. You have no right to dictate your own wardrobe. You have no right to dictate how we should and shouldn't worship God. This is the building. Jesus said, I will build my church. Lord. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. I don't have any right to tell the architect how he's to let his people dress, how they're to conduct themselves, how they're to worship. I don't have any right to say it. That's his plan. That's his way. If I join it, I'm in. Glory to God. If I join up, I take it as it is. I've got to receive the stone. I've got to build on the stone. Glory to God. Our women have stood out for decades. Yeah. You're going to stand out more. Yes. All right. yes. Men, we're going to start standing out more. Yes, sir. Come on. Yeah. But let it not be merely our dress. That's just one thing. My, and that's a minor thing if I can put it that way. 
Let it be our principle. Let it be our passion for God. Let it be the kind of people that you and I are. I'm just here to tell you something. That this building is such that it's not built any old way. The stones are laid. There is first of all a chief cornerstone. And everything is laid in relative to that stone. They are placed with a purpose. And if somehow when it comes from the quarry, he didn't get it right. Back to the quarry. Back to the quarry, bud. You got to get it right or we ain't building here. I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you're going to look around and you're going to see the churches that look to be prosperous and they're growing left and right and they're compromising left and right and they don't preach nothing hardly worth listening to. They become a bunch of cheap entertainment and to get the world into the church and make them think we've got something and we can't even turn a nation around that's going to hell at a breakneck speed. We can't even turn the government around. We're not turning against homosexuality. We're endorsing it. We're not putting down abortion. We're endorsing it. And we've become the church world that has bought a pile of rubbish. But I'm going to reach into the rubbish. I'm going to reach into the rubbish. And I'm going to pull me out of stone. And I'm going to put it back in place. Yeah, glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. Woo. Yes, sir. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Hallelujah! 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 Stand to your feet this morning. I'm tempted. But that's as far as it goes. We're not careful. If we're not careful, you hear me. We'll get to the place we think. That Holy Ghost baptism isn't so important. Uh Uh-oh. I'm making it fine. No, you're not. You're dying. Come on now. We're not careful. We'll let things of this life come in and zap our victory. And in the process, if we just deal with the issues of life, we'll let them change us. And we'll begin to neglect the stones. You hear me very much this morning. This church has an order. There's an order in our salvation. There's an order in that Bible. There are doctrines that are prominent in those scriptures. And I'm here to tell you they represent stones. We live our life a certain way. We do things a certain way, Sister Gracie. There are some things, if it's just a man-made thing, then okay. It may be if necessary, if it is absolutely necessary, that can be adjusted. But there is also value to hanging on to something that is ancient. I'm telling you, if you don't even want to dig into the business a Bible version. There is a value for us having the same version that I read as a child, that my dad read, and that my grandpa read. Why is that? Because when we get up and there there becomes a scriptural language, well, I don't want to make it that hard. I want everybody to read this. I'm telling you right now, you don't join any organization and know everything off the bat. You don't go into the company. You got to find out how they operate. You got to learn the language. You got to read the handbook. And I'm telling you there's nothing wrong with you learning to read the blessed King James Version because I'm going to quote it, I'm going to preach it, and my granddad is going to quote it, and you need to know and be familiar so that you know when I'm quoting scripture, you ought to know where it came from. Hallelujah. Right. But we get it written so many ways, we don't even know what it is anymore. That's right, yeah. The truth. I read different versions. You know that. You know my stand. But I'm telling you there is value. Right. When a preacher gets up, he shouldn't even cite chapter and verse, but he just starts using the language of Scripture in his preaching. You ought to recognize it as Scripture. That's exactly right. But if we're not all reading the same book, we won't recognize it as Scripture. That's right. 
Is that all right? That's good. Glory to the Lamb of God. You don't even know it's Bible. You ought to know whenever that man gets up and starts quoting, you ought to know something about it. If you want to, read them all. I don't care in that regard. But somewhere there are some traditions that we've laid down. There may sometime become a change, uh, necessary to change something. But I'm telling you the principle and the rock solid doctrine is immutable. It's unchangeable. We're not going to turn it around. We're not going to compromise. It's written in stone, glory to God. It's written in stone, glory to God. And this building is built a certain way. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones yeah. and favor the dust yes. thereof. Right. <laughs> There's an order. Thank God I cut my teeth on it. I'm proud to have my mama here with us today. Yeah. I'm also thankful to say today that the message I preach. And the life I live is the life I learned yeah. coming up in that old country church, yeah. Stemple Ridge and St. George. I came up and my daddy preached, simple man, simple message. But he brought forth those truths and he hammered them again and again yeah. and again yeah. and again. Yeah. And what I build today. I'm building on that same foundation because he put some stones in, in that building, glory. Yeah. And he really didn't put them there. There was men before him that came before he ever came. My daddy was lost without God. But one day, he was able to see the real order of things. Glory to God. And the way that his mama lived, he knew it was right. And all that drinking and carousing is not what God intended him to be and brought him back. My mom was a brethren, but she came out and got a hold of that old town Pentecost. And when you get into it, I'm here to tell you, there's a certain way about it. You can't remake it. If you try to remake it, you'll kill it. You'll lose the power. There hasn't been an occasion in history. Every time we try to rewrite the standard, we lose the standard bearer. Every time we try to make it like the world, we lose the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going down that road. I'm going to build. I'm going to build. Glory to God. Work, saith God, and know that your labor is not in vain. I know your works. I know your labors and your patience. Hear me, my people, today. Do not succumb to the temptations that would have you leave the stones that have been laid by those going on before, the foundation stones that even I have placed. Hear me, my people. I am the Lord thy God today, and I will be your blesser. I will be the one that lifts you up. I will raise you up and bring you through and show you my glory. Take pleasure in the stones. Stones. Take pleasure in the stones. Oh, my people favor not the wealth of the world, but the dust and the rubbish. And reach into there and find a stone. And I, your God, will be with you. And I will bless you. And you will know my power. Do not turn unto the building blocks of the world and the fundamentals of your culture. Turn to my stones that are ever tried, saith God Almighty. Oh, 
Mm-hmm. 